Good afternoon. We're doing it live right here, doing more at four in 2024. Motec on Money, live on the air here in 790 KBC, right after Ben Shapiro and just before the 790 KBC News Blitz with Randy Wang at five. We are on the air live here on 790 KBC, streaming live online worldwide at kbc.com and your on-demand Motec on Money podcast, kbc.com, Apple iTunes, and all your favorite podcast platforms. Well, we just saw the Dow post its worst day since the March 2023 banking crisis. Stocks moving sharply lower with the Dow down for the fourth session in a row. And we've seen four trading days so far in the second quarter of 2024. The Dow coming in for a closing loss today of 530 points. This on concerns about the Fed's ability to cut interest rates this year amid a backdrop of inflationary pressures climbing oil prices and the economic news. In fact, we'll be getting the Next reading on the jobs front on Friday, that's the so-called big enchilada of monthly economic reports. So uh, we'll be getting that first thing Friday morning. April's sudden sell-off in the stocks intensifying today on the concerns uh, just mentioned. And also the Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari, who ran for California governor some years ago, by the way, said today that progress on inflation has stalled, which could leave the Fed unable to cut rates this year if the trend continues. That spooked the market, and the Dow was down more than 500 points, posting its worst one-day drop since March of 2023 when we were talking about the banking crisis at the time. The other major averages also pulled back. The S&P 500 down 64. The Nasdaq dropped 228 points. Stocks gave up earlier gains to close sharply lower today ahead of that big jobs report, which we'll be getting first thing tomorrow morning for the month of March from the Labor Department. Who knew that we had cash storage places around Southern California, and one of them got uh, broken into? It's kind of a thing that uh, they make movies out of. We'll talk about the latest crime reports with the Honorable Dennis Zine. We'll be on the line with Dennis Zine later this hour, former L.A. City Council member, former LAPD sergeant, and current LAPD reserve officer. And what about that uh, so-called mansion tax that was supposed to raise money for the homeless here in Los Angeles? Well, after one year, it's fallen well short of expectations and in the meantime has really put a big chill on the commercial real estate business here in the Los Angeles area. I'll talk about it, and I'll talk about it with Susan Shelley, columnist for the Southern California News Group and host of the Howard Jarvis radio show, heard Friday nights right here on 790 KABC. But first, on this rough day and so far a rough start to the second quarter of 2024, joining us live now, Jonathan Honig, Fox News contributor, portfolio manager at Capitalist Pig Hedge Fund, and author of the book Price is Primary, How to Profit with Any Asset in Any Market at Any Time. Jonathan Honig, thanks very much for stepping up to the plate on uh, the worst uh, one-day drop we've seen in, in more than a year here. Give us uh, your reaction to uh, today's market action. Well, Frank, it's great to be back with you. And you know what's amazing is the market is so... Uh, you know, it really hasn't taken much of a dive from its all-time high at all. I mean, it was, you know, just three or four days ago, the market was up at its all-time high. But you're absolutely right. It's been a pretty rough go as of as of, of lately, uh, especially this past week. And I tell you, what's leading the way down is what I'm seeing is previously it had led the way up. Apple, for example, uh, just today at the lowest point it was it's trading now since last October. So, uh, what I'm seeing is a theme we talked about for the last couple of weeks now, which is, in effect, a changing of the guard. A lot of the names that had led the market for quite some time, the the MAG7 names, the big cap tech, they're sitting this one out. And we're seeing international names, commodities in particular, they're leading the chart. And once again, heat up. On the air live with investment expert Jonathan Honig from Fox News and and Fox Business. So yeah, we had the the magnificent seven, and then we have the uh, the fat. We're down to the Fab Four, maybe, or maybe even down to just the magnificent one, uh, namely Nvidia. What about those uh, originally called the magnificent seven and um, Fab Four and uh, and Nvidia at this point? Wonderful company, but you know, Frank. It, in many ways, these companies remind me of a lot of the names that we saw in the early part of the 1970s. You know, back then they called it the, the so-called Nifty 50. It was names like Kodak, for example. Wonderful growth companies, but the valuations were so stretched that it took the better part of a decade for those names ultimately to grow into to their valuations. That's my sense. We're seeing that very similar period now. Is uh, So much of the strength that I'm seeing is, for example, like I said, in gold at a new all-time high, uh, just earlier today, silver is at a new 52-week high. 
uh, energy prices now breaking out once again. You've got gas uh, going to be above $4 a gallon, most likely in much of the country, by certainly by the time the election rolls around. So, you know, inflation is not dead at all. And uh, I was surprised to hear even earlier this week, Jay Powell talking about still the potential for interest rate cuts. Um, many of these markets suggest that you could be even seeing interest rate hikes by the end of the year. So uh, the market's at a turning road, uh, a turning point right now, and I think inflation is uh, ground zero, if you will. Well, commodities have been on, on a tear, and just at a time we're told inflation is supposedly easing, suddenly gold hitting record highs, uh, as you noted, and that's uh, something we were following, and, and silver at the highest uh, we've seen in um, in, what, nearly three years now. Uh, and we'll, we'll take a closer look at, at those uh, prices here uh, coming up here shortly. But uh, what about uh, the outlook for the precious metals, um, given uh, what's happening? Yeah, I think a rising tide lifts all boats. And, you know, it's it's not just gold, or even or silver, Frank. I mean, copper, for example, CPER, that's an ETF that uh, your investors can take a look at. It owns a basket of copper names. It's at a 52-week high. And, you know, just as in bull markets for stocks, uh, the rising tide let, tends to lift all boats. I think you're seeing the same thing with commodities. In fact, one security you might want to, to evaluate now is it's an index of commodities, DBC. That's David Boy Charlie, DBC. Basically owns it. Think of it almost like the Dow Jones of commodities. Some uh, natural gas, some crude oil, some uh, gold and precious metals, but it'll do well as that basket of commodities do, does. And what's so fascinating, Frank, is even at the time that, for example, like you said, gold's at an all-time high, the ratio of commodities to stocks is at an all-time low or near an all-time low. So, uh, you know, I think this is a trend that could can persist for, for at least the next couple of months or even years to come. So DBC is one play, way to play that trend for higher commodity prices around the board. All right. So we see gold right now around uh, 2309. Uh, did hit record highs uh, Again, and we see a silver right now hovering just below twenty-seven dollars an ounce. Um, any thoughts on, on where uh, gold and silver go from here? And, and say, if, if gold goes to five thousand, uh, would you sell it? <laughs> well, there's no <laughs> tops in a bull market, Frank. As you know, and they tend to persist. Even witness what we've seen in Bitcoin in the last uh, you know four or five years. I mean, heights that we all you know have really thought were crazy and. Uh, this is the nature of bull markets. They tend to go on, and oftentimes with a lot of different reasons along the way. I think back to the bull market in gold from 2001 to 2010, all the different reasons that were given. You know, Some of it was worries about uh, the Obama presidency, worries about the war, worries about uh, threat terror, threat levels. So you get all those different news pegs, if you will, along a, a long-term bull market. So, you know, right now, Frank, it could be worries about inflation. There could be other concerns, maybe global and geopolitical in the months to come. But what you want to do is hold for that long-term and hold on for that, that longer-term move. So I think we're seeing that in gold, just as we saw with Bitcoin in the, in the, in the last couple of years. All right. So we had that uh, blockbuster first quarter and a, and a very rough start here to the to the second quarter here with this drop today of 530 points and the Dow Jones Industrial Average down, by the way, 1.35 percent. So not a, a huge drop uh, on a percentage basis, but certainly uh, the sort of thing gets attention. Uh, and the biggest drop, uh, by the way, since that uh, banking crisis, uh, when we were concerned also about uh, commercial real estate, which uh, remains a concern. So uh, where do you see this market go from here? Well, I'll tell you, the best advice I have is one that came from a famous investor, Paul Tudor Jones. I know you know his name, Frank, one of the most successful investors of all time. His advice was losers, average losers. Basically, what that means is don't fight the tape. If you had, in my opinion, if you have a stock like Apple, uh, you know, hitting multi-month or, you know, six-month lows, it's not a place you want to average on the way down. You want to try to go where, if you will, the action is. Go where what's working now in terms of putting new money to work. So, you know, one idea I still like are those energy MLPs. MLP stands for Master Limited Partnerships. Basically, they're energy names with very high dividends, all in bull markets. And the way to play that could be AMLP. Again, it's that basket of energy-related uh, names. And as we said, Frank, uh, rising tide lifts all boats. So with so many energy stocks doing well, I think I'd be focusing on that rather than trying to uh, pick bottoms in last year's winners like Apple or Tesla and the like. 
Right. You probably saw that report. Uh, I believe oil stocks uh, have hit the highest uh, since, what, 2014. That That is quite remarkable. And you can you don't have to be fancy about it. Something very simple like XLE, that's uh, X-Ray Larry E as an energy, just a basket of those large cap, you know, the Exxon Mobil, the Occidental Petroleums. Um, and and in, during the 1970s, Frank, energy stocks, interestingly, were the only area of the market, energy and real estate, to actually hold up uh, and do well. So uh, I think that's in terms of stocks. You certainly don't want to sell those names right now. In fact, you can add to them. I also think you can buy a lot of the emerging markets. They're so out of favor. Uh, they're so weak and they're so darn cheap compared to our own uh, domestic markets. So uh, uh, one that I like, we've talked about a, a lot, Frank, is Africa. That's A-F-K, also related to commodities. And good time to diversify out of uh, Microsoft and, and Google and the like. Those are last year's names. Look for what's going to be next. Yeah, isn't that something? Even NVIDIA today down more than $30, back to uh, eight fifty nine. by the way. Apple down nearly a dollar to one sixty eight and change. And, um, yeah, emerging markets, or, or some are, I've called them submerging uh, markets, right? Uh, so thanks for uh, that guidance. Anything else uh, internationally that's uh, catching your attention? Sure, sure. You know, look, more than anything, I think you have to take J.P. Morgan's advice, Frank. I mean, he always talked about selling down to the sleeping point. We've, we've barely corrected three or four percent off the all time highs. So, you know, if listeners are, you know, shaking in their boots over, you know, a two percent drop in the markets, perhaps they are a little bit too invested or over invested. And, you know, what worries me, Frank, bigger picture is this compounding impact of inflation. Kind of a fascinating stat out this week from uh, the Heritage Foundation. 40% of all the income taxes paid now actually go to service interest on the debt. Uh, so this inflation isn't going, uh, going away anytime soon. It's, it's, in fact, I think it could be compounding once again. So uh, I'm looking towards the international names. One I like quite a bit right now is DFIS. It's David Frank, I as an island, S as in Sam. International small cap stocks, again, Totally off the radar screen, underowned and darn cheap compared to names like NVIDIA, which, as you said, even despite being down today, still up. The countdown is on for the 2024 NFL Draft, presented by Bud Light, live from Detroit, and you can attend in person for free. Welcome to the NFL Draft. See the next NFL stars and experience the ultimate NFL fan festival, featuring live concerts, interactive games, player autographs, and more. The NFL Draft, presented by Bud Light, April 25th through 27th. Visit NFL.com slash draft access to register for free entry today. Our house is a mess. Come on in. I'm Amber Wallen, internet comedian and host of your new favorite podcast, Fly on the Wallen. Okay, that's pretty <laughs> presumptuous to assume that this is going to be their favorite podcast, by the way. Anyway, that wasp that you just heard interrupt me is my husband. And co-host, Benjamin Wallen. Listen in as we discuss relationships and keeping our sweet baby kid alive. Fly on the Wallen, wherever you listen. some 50% just this year. Certainly. And we're watching a uh, bond yields. Uh, I didn't mention uh, this at the beginning. I don't want to put the audience to sleep, but we do pay attention to this. Uh, the 10 year note uh, at 4.31%. This is the one that impacts the fixed rate mortgage rates, which already uh, those rising rates again, uh, apparently are putting a chill on, on mortgage a activity. Um, so what about, uh, what about these bond yields edging higher? And, and what would you do uh, about that? No, audience shouldn't be going to sleep, Frank. I mean, this is really the most important number. It's the number that yeah. we all say that or we're going to borrow it if we want to buy a house or buy a car. And what's been so fascinating is even as Biden's been talking about you know, inflation going down and the Fed just this week talking about interest rate cuts, well, interest rates have been going up. You know, we, even this year, they're up about by about 10 percent. That 10 years gone from 4 percent to almost 4.4 percent a little early this week. And uh, that's my fear, Frank, is much like in the mid 1970s, Gerald Ford thought he had whipped inflation. Now, two years later, interest rates had more than doubled. And of course, gold at that point had soared to an all time high of just about seven or eight hundred dollars an ounce. So uh, I think you're likely to see interest rates surprise everyone by, as I said, moving higher uh, and uh, confounding even more people's attempt to get into the housing market for the first time. 
All right. And the expectation uh, for during this rally has been we're uh, in for a soft landing here. A lot riding on the jobs report, uh, which we'll be getting first thing uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, Jonathan Honing, what's your uh, prediction on, on how that's going to look and what kind of market reaction uh, might we get? I have to say, uh, Frank, I'm, I'm as perplexed as everyone else. I mean, my big fear is that our expectation has been a little bit too rosy uh, about the state of the economy. It's been fed by years and years of consumer spending. And look, the consumer is simply tapped out. Uh, we're paying on average of 20 some thousand dollars more this year than we were for the same basket of goods and services just two years ago. At the same time, our uh, credit card bills have piled up. You know, Frank, the average Gen Xer, that's a group I happen to be a part of, has $10,000 worth of credit card debt right now. So, uh, you know, I think we're tapped out. Unfortunately, that's going to help. That's going to make it very difficult to soften the next slowdown in the economy. So, look, I'm not a Cassandra, but I am concerned when I see stock prices dropping and gold rising as it has in recent weeks. All right, Jonathan Honig, any other specific places where you'd be putting money now and or perhaps taking it off the table? Well, sure. I mean, one that kind of fits into some of these themes we've talked about, international, commodity-related, uh, is a deep value sector and a deep value country right now, Frank. It's actually Norway, E-N-O-R. That's the stock that ETF that tracks the Norwegian stock market. Lots of uh, energy companies, as you might imagine, Dirt cheap. In fact, that market really hasn't gone anywhere for the better part of four years, but it's just breaking out to its uh, 52-week high that tends to be a good technical indicator if you want to get in just as the market starts to break out to new highs. So E-N-O-R, do your own due diligence, but Norway could be a great place to uh, pipe some profits in the weeks to come. Jerome Jonathan, well, thank you very much for taking the call here uh, on a rough-and-tumble day uh, for stocks, uh, the worst uh, one-day drop we've seen uh, so far in 2024 coming off the uh, big uh, first quarter rally that that brought the market to a uh, record highs a very interesting time here at the moment we'll follow it closely with you jonathan honig fox news contributor fox business channel as well portfolio manager at capitalist pig hedge fund and author of the book price is primary how to profit with any asset in any market at any time jonathan it's always terrific to speak with you thank you very much for coming to the line this afternoon delighted thank you frank good evening thank you very much Friends, if you're hurt in an accident, you need an experienced advocate. And Clark Fielding and his team of sharks at Fielding Law are on standby ready to dive into your case. My friend Clark the Shark is fearless for justice and your go-to attorney when injured in an accident that was not your fault. Whether it's a car accident, slip, trip, fall, or any kind of personal injury, Fielding Law is here to make sure you get the care, attention, and compensation you deserve. Fielding Law can assess the circumstances of the case, negotiate tenaciously with the insurance companies, and if necessary, file a lawsuit and litigate to seek fair compensation on behalf of you, the injured party. An injury is a major disruption in your life, medical expenses, lost wages, pain and suffering, property damage, and other losses incurred as a result of the injury are all part of the damages. Don't try and handle the process alone. You need an expert in the process, and the team at Fielding Law are the ones to trust. Put Clark Fielding's number in your phone right now under the word accident. That number is 833-88-SHARK, 833-88-SHARK. Or go to ClarkTheSharkLaw.com. Down. That's the word today. This is Motec on Money on 790 KBC. Stocks pulling back. In fact, the worst one-day drop we've seen so far this year. In fact, the worst since that uh, banking crisis that we saw last March. The Dow coming in for a closing loss of 530 points. Back to 38,597. The S&P 500 down 64. Back to 5,147. And the NASDAQ down 228. At 16,049, the Dow down every day so far this week, down four sessions in a row, starting off the second quarter of 2024 down. Taking a look at the yield in the 10-year note at the moment, it's been uh, flirting with 440 right now at 4.32%. Checking the cryptos now, we've seen a wild ride there too. Bitcoin at the moment down 133 at 68,313. Ethereum down 8. 3,321. And uh, let's bring up Doge, which has seen a pretty decent run up lately, and then a pullback, and now at 18 cents. Price of gold kissing record highs this week. Right now, at 90 cents at $2,309.40 an ounce. Silver pulling back 27 cents at $26.98 after popping above $27 an ounce yesterday, the highest we've seen in nearly three years. The Magnificent One, NVIDIA, down about $30 today at 8.59 and change. And Apple pulling back 83 cents 
at 168.82. Motaco Money continues here in 790 KBC. Good afternoon. Turning to taxes now, a year into the so-called Los Angeles Mansion Tax, which was supposed to raise money for the homeless. Looks like this tax has raised just a fraction of expectations and also has put a big chill on commercial real estate. That tax means a 4% tax on properties selling for $5 million or more and 5.5% on properties above $10 million. Looks like it's just raised a fraction of expectations. Let's bring in the expert on all this, Susan Shelley, columnist for the Southern California News Group and host of the Howard Jarvis Radio Show, heard Friday nights right here on 790 KBC. Susan, thank you very much for taking the call. out to talk to you about but first on this uh, mansion tax uh, report. Uh, give us an update. Well, it's one year since Measure ULA took effect. It's a, as you said, 4% tax on real estate transactions above $4 million, 5.5% above $10 million. And although it was sold as a mansion tax, it's not just mansions. It's apartment buildings and any commercial property in that price range in the city of Los Angeles. So obviously the first thing it did was make Los Angeles non-competitive against all the surrounding cities that don't tax real estate transfers. Really big news, certainly, for commercial real estate people. And we've had Lou Horn, uh, who's a giant in commercial real estate here uh, in Los Angeles, on uh, this program talking about this. And, and again, uh, the name of this thing, the mansion tax, uh, was another deception on the voters here. It sure was. It was a deception, and it's also an unconstitutional tax. So everybody should know that this could be overturned later this year by an appellate court. It was upheld by a lower court, but the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association and the Apartment Association of Greater Los Angeles are suing because it's unconstitutional. Proposition 13 prohibited real estate transfer taxes, and the Los Angeles City Charter prohibits the voters from passing anything by initiative that the city can't pass itself. So it's unconstitutional two ways. And we're pretty confident that the appellate court will give that a serious look. That's so important, and we'll be watching that uh, case uh, very, very closely. So in the meantime, this uh, this tax has just raised a fraction of what they were expecting, right, uh, because of the, the chill it's had on uh, commercial and, uh, and high-end uh, real estate activity here. Absolutely. It, it has also chilled new construction, because if you're going to build something – and then sell it, you have to pencil in now that you have to pay this tax, and it's just causing these projects not to pencil out. So it has raised about $250 million. It was anticipated to raise up to a billion dollars a year, and in the first year, $250 million. So that's not going very well. And really, it's it's such a destructive tax, because in the name of building more housing, it's it's stopping private enterprise from building housing. The companies that are nonprofit organizations that want to buy these properties, they don't have to pay the tax. They're exempt. But if you're a private enterprise, you don't want any government money. You don't want any grants. You're just going to do business in Los Angeles. You have to pay this tax. And interestingly, it's not a tax on capital gains. It's a tax on the sale price or the transfer price. It doesn't even have to be a sale. And as a result, even a property that's in foreclosure is subject to this tax when the when escrow closes. So for instance, the gas company tower in downtown LA on which there's a default of $465 million in loans, if that was to sell in a foreclosure sale for that amount, it would be a $25 million tax on a building that's in the hole. So where does that money come from? And and how how does this help Los Angeles to be taxing all these real estate properties, it just chills the market, as you said, and it doesn't bring in the revenue they were hoping for. And was not what, uh, not a mansion tax, absolutely right. It's a so-called mansion tax uh, that impacts uh, commercial real estate and those uh, high-end uh, transactions. So it's just amazing uh, what happens there when with these uh, when these labels are, are placed on them and, and people are uh, are deceived. Now, what about um, the, the current uh, situation where, the government spending on homeless programs is being closely scrutinized. Uh, the federal judge uh, overseeing all of this now uh, requesting an audit. Uh, what's the very latest on all that? Well, this is fascinating. What happened here is there was a lawsuit by downtown businesses and residents to force the city and the county to actually spend the money that they're spending on homelessness to house and shelter people and get everybody off the sidewalk. And that lawsuit, which I think was filed in 2018 or 2019, 
was settled in 20... Mike Carruthers shares little pieces of intel and interviews you can use to improve your life on the Something You Should Know podcast. The next time you're looking for a job and have to write a cover letter, here's some advice from Skip Freeman, author of a book called Headhunter's Hiring Secrets. Add a P.S. to the bottom of that cover letter. That can actually increase the chances of that letter being read by up to 75%. Some people actually glance down and read the P.S. first. Something You Should Know. Search on YouTube or wherever you listen. 22, and the city did not live up to its part of the settlement. So the plaintiffs went back to court and they said, we want a $6.4 million fine imposed on the city for failing to comply with the settlement terms. And the judge, I don't think, ordered that, but he did order an audit, a comprehensive, wide-ranging audit of all the spending in Los Angeles on homelessness pro- programs going back quite a ways. You can only imagine the salaries, the waste, the problems that are going to be uncovered as Los Angeles just blew through something like $600 million in in spending on homelessness programs, not including what's been spent since Mayor Karen Bass was elected. There's another $250 million in the current budget for homelessness programs. No outcomes, no data, nothing to show that any of it is working. And all they ask us for from the government is more money. Now there's something circulating for signatures that would double the Measure H homelessness tax in L.A. County and take off the sunset date so that you'll pay a higher sales tax forever in Los Angeles for more of these homelessness program salaries. It's really it's 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 borderline criminal what they're doing here. On the air live with Susan Shelley, columnist for the Southern California News Group and host of the Howard Jarvis radio show, heard Friday nights on your favorite station right here, 790 KBC. And, and Susan, let me ask you about Prop 1, which finally uh, ended up winning, right, uh, in this last election. Just barely, yes. Out of 7.5 million votes cast, I think it prevailed by 30,000. So just barely. And unfortunately, yep. this is more of the same spending on more of the same programs. Uh, two billion, this is a $6.38 billion bond. Two billion of that is going into these same Project Home Keep programs that are essentially renovating old hotels for top dollar charged to the taxpayers and then housing homeless people. Where are the outcomes that show that this is either cost effective or effective at all? at helping people, there really are, there's no data showing that any of this is working. So it's not working because if it was working, they would be telling us all the success stories and we're not hearing them. So that's a concern. And then the rest of it, of course, you have a concern over the fact that this is borrowed money and you have to pay it back with interest, which raises that $6.3 billion bond to about 10 or $12 billion. And on top of that, it's going to take money away from the counties that are that the counties are using for mental health services and divert 30 percent of that money into these same housing programs with no track record of success. So overall, it's just asking for new taxes, borrowing from the future, using the reserves. It's it's just spending and spending and spending with no record of success. The problem continues to get worse. The policy has to change to something that will work. They have to look at the premises of what they're doing. And they have to make some serious changes or this is just going to be a black hole to spend money forever. A couple of other things I'd like to talk to you about, including uh, top of mind, this uh, raising the minimum wage for uh, fast food restaurants and some exceptions. Right. Uh, uh, Gavin Newsom's restaurant offering a $16 hourly wage to uh, an employee, according to one report, uh, this Plump Jack Cafe in Olympic Valley, California, looking for a part time busser. So if anyone's interested in that, uh, tell us about that report and, and what we need to know about this uh, this kick up in the yeah. minimum wage. Well, this is horrible. This is a new law that was signed. It was negotiated by the Service Employees International Union uh, behind closed doors with uh, non-disclosure agreements. And the reason for that is because the restaurant industry had qualified a referendum for November to reverse a similar law that had been passed earlier. And this was a negotiation over whether they would or would not pull that referendum off the ballot. So there was a secret negotiation. The major restaurant companies got what they wanted, which was to be relieved of liability for any labor law violations in the workplace by their franchisees. They got that. They signed off. They pulled the referendum off the ballot. Well, who got stuck? The franchisees, because the deal was a $20 minimum wage. 
up from 16. And so they are paying the price, and many of them are closing. And as you said, the Plump Jack Cafe owned by the governor is not involved in this because it doesn't count as fast food. And last but not least, remember the uh, discussion uh, with much value who the governor was uh, proposing, uh, basically a windfall profits tax, but not calling it that on the oil companies. Now we have gas prices about uh, 30 cents a gallon higher than they were just a month ago, 523 for regular 556 now the average price for a premium. Uh, what about uh, on that front, uh, whatever happened with this um, elaborate plan to um, penalize uh, oil companies here in California? Well, they've never found any evidence that the oil companies are doing anything illegal. What raises the price of oil and gas in California is first that we've stopped drilling for it, and we, we've, we've stopped fracking, we've stopped drilling. Uh, the governor is opposed to fossil fuel production at all. And so that doesn't help. You have less supply. We're bringing it in from other places. We're bringing in oil on tanker trucks in California, uh, and tanker, tanker ships rather, and through natural gas through pipelines because we're not producing it here. So that raises the cost. And then you have yep. the cap and trade program, which is a, a hidden tax on energy. That raises the cost. And the uh, low carbon fuel standard, which is another regulatory boondoggle, in my opinion, that raises the cost. It's all of these policy choices that raise the cost, not oil company chicanery. They're, they haven't found anything that the oil companies have done that's illegal. Susan, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us here on all these big stories today. Susan Shelley, columnist for the Southern California News Group, host of the Howard Jarvis radio show, heard Friday nights right here on 790 KBC. It's great to speak with you as always, Susan. Thank you very much for coming to the line this afternoon. Thank you, Frank. Barnaby Jones may have to be called in on this one. Motec on Money continues here, 790 KBC. The LAPD and the FBI now investigating the theft of tens of millions of dollars from a money storage facility in the San Fernando Valley on Easter Sunday. The thieves broke into that place undetected without setting off alarms by going through the roof and somehow getting into the money storage area, which might have been a vault. The company that owns the building did not uh, discover the massive theft until earlier this week. Joining us live now, Dennis Zine, the Honorable Dennis Zine, former L.A. City Council member, former LAPD sergeant, current LAPD reserve officer. Dennis Zine is on the line to talk crime this afternoon. Dennis, first of all, your reaction to this uh, big heist right there in the Valley? Frank, I'm surprised it took this long. It took this long to have this kind of situation take place. Uh, There are these places established in various parts of Los Angeles where cash is stored for a variety of reasons. And in this particular situation, as much as $30 million taken in this elaborate scheme, uh, this is not a unique situation where the cash is stored. This particular situation we know is now public record, but many businesses, because of the cash and the banks with the concern about cash and drug money, et cetera, there are places that do store that cash and then it's deposited in different segments So the bottom line in this is it's an intricate detailed plan uh, carried out. I'm sure some of the individuals involved had direct involvement with the operations of the company, uh, a guard company and uh, inside job. And that's what it looks like, an inside Mm -hmm. job that was effective and taking $30 million in cash. Everybody's talking about it. So we had to ask you about that uh, first right off the bat. In the meantime, uh, Far-left uh, California Democrats uh, want light-on-crime policies, as we've seen, arguing uh, raising penalties and undoing Prop 47 could mean California is running back to the tough-on-crime days back in the 80s and 90s that led to uh, a lot of people uh, going to jail. A couple of bills now in Sacramento will require counties to set up diversion programs for theft-related offenses and increase staffing at, at grocery store at checkout counters. Uh, give us your reaction to, to these latest reports. This is another philosophy of our district attorney, George Gascon, that no one's guilty of doing anything. They do things because they wish to do, and society has to then crumble and let people get ripped off. It's another ridiculous decision by the people who believe that crime does not count and people are not held accountable and responsible. It's just another extension of the Gascon philosophy. So the people up in Sacramento will take those laws, make those laws. We have to live by those laws, and it's just another slap and law and order, another slap towards victims. If this takes place, it'll be more crime and more activities of an illegal nature and the honest citizens keep on getting the uh, negative aspects of this type of legislation. Absolutely ridiculous to think even implement something like that. 
All right, and we heard recently that shoplifting up, what, 81% in the Los Angeles area. What about uh, how crime is uh, is reported uh, these days? Well, it's interesting you ask that, Frank. Uh, the c- traditional mapping system is being scrubbed. They now have what's been implemented by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, National Incident-Based Reporting System, a whole new revolutionary system that will track each and every crime that's associated. For example, if someone puts a gun to your head and steals your car, well, that's a robbery and then a GTA. If there's an assault and a robbery, so they're going to specify each individual crime. So this national incident-based reporting system is going to implement, they're doing it by bureau at a time, Central Bureau, West Bureau, uh, South and Valley bureaus are going to come online. So in a couple months, we'll see. Meanwhile, uh, those statistics are not available. They're not generating the statistics that they did in the past because they're changing the whole system. And this is a national program that is being implemented in law enforcement throughout the country called the National Incident-Based Reporting System. And it's going to revolutionize the way that crime is reported. And what you'll see is an increase in all crimes because instead of just stealing the car at GTA, you got something else in addition to that. So uh, it's just going to be uh, skewing the statistics as far as I can see. That's very interesting. In the meantime, it appears crimes are, are underreported, right? Since uh, these days, uh, a lot of people are just told, yeah, go ahead and fill it out online, uh, report it that way, and uh, or there's no uh, police response uh, and so forth. Uh, give us the real uh, on what's what's really happening out there. Well, there's not enough police officers, number one. We know there's a shortage of dispatchers. Sometimes you wait five minutes for a 911 call to be handled, uh, be answered, and a car dispatched. So we're struggling for personnel resources. Meanwhile, uh, the federal government comes in. The FBI says now we need to have more detailed information on the crime stats. So you'll see crime stats go up and more people get victimized. And I have more and more people contacting me. How can I secure my residents, myself, my family, uh, people who never, ever thought of getting a weapon to protect themselves and their family are doing it just because of the concern and and crime wave that we have happening. And I keep on telling people, if Gascon gets reelected in this November election, then I say it's time to move out of Los Angeles County because there will be nothing but crime and violence and a lack of police resources to address the situation. It's really a sad commentary for the people of Los Angeles County, not only LA City, but LA County. And Frank, let me ask one, one more thing I want to add to it. We have a big event this Saturday at Warner Center Park at 1500 Topanga Canyon. We invite the public to come out. It's a joint operation between the police department and fire department. Come out and enjoy yourself with a lot of activities, a car show, Warner Center Park. It starts at 9 o'clock, 9 to 4 this Saturday in Woodland Hills at Warner Center Park. It's free. Come out and bring your kids. Enjoy the helicopter flyovers and all the displays by the police and fire department for the community. A free event called Grateful Hearts. LAPD, LA Fire Department for the community of the city of Los Angeles. And to support the police department, that's the 15th annual I see here, Grateful Hearts of Fundraiser, LAPD and LAFD Car Show. And of course, if it's a car show, that means, uh, of course, Jay Leno will be there, right? Special guest appearance from from Jay Leno. So uh, Saturday at uh, 9 a.m. at Warner Park. Looks like a fantastic event there. And uh, I'm sure you'll be there, Dennis Hine. I will be there. And also Fabio, those people who love Fabio, Fabio, a strong supporter of LAPD who's been burglarized three times at his residence. Fabio will be there along with Jay Leno meeting the people. And it's a wonderful event to come out and meet the people, public safety personnel who are very frustrated with the situation we see as far as support for law enforcement, fire service in the city of the Angels. Dennis Zine on the line with us, the Honorable Dennis Zine, former L.A. City Council member, longtime LAPD sergeant, current LAPD Reserve Officer. Dennis, it's always a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much for coming to the line this afternoon. Thank you, Frank. Motec on Money continues tomorrow at 4 o'clock. We'll be doing more at 4. In the meantime, stay tuned now for the 790 KBC News Blitz with Randy Wang right here on 790 KBC. The Rolling Stone Music Now podcast gets inside the biggest stories with Rolling Stone senior writer Brian Hyatt. Now here is my conversation with Jacob Knoll. Your story is, is an amazing one, and obviously you lost your dad when you are only one year old. It was definitely a screwy way to grow up. I think that a lot of people never heard of who I am, and then they see me join this band, and they must think this kid must have just handed everything, or nepotism kid. It's a gift that I have an opportunity to sing in such a big band like my father and my uncle's band, Sublime. Rolling Stone Music Now, wherever you listen.